Hey, it's Mark Ferguson with Invest For More, and I'm standing outside my 68,000 square foot strip mall that has an office, grocery store, some other businesses in it. And the square footage is very important for this video because the state of Colorado is making us improve the energy efficiency of this building based on its square footage. And we'll talk about that new law, what we have to do, and of course we'll talk about which buildings are exempt and don't have to abide by this rule and law, and I'll let you take a guess on that. Now, we do have a lot of interesting things going on when you own a building like that, like snow removal and um, heating, parking lots. We've been over a lot of that. We redid our parking lot lately. Um, we've had to reduce some of the HVAC lately, but I bought this building in 2018 for 2.1 million. It's probably worth close to 6 million now. It's been a great property, but we also spent quite a bit of money fixing it up, adding tenants, and um, making it a much nicer place than it was. And Colorado has decided uh, we need to improve it even more with its energy efficiency and that our building is contributing to the climate crisis and we need to fix it. Um, of course, they're making us pay more fees and different things in order to run this program, too. <laughs> There's also a lot of other crazy programs and things going on with rental properties and even business commercial in Colorado, too. And we'll talk about some of those and why it's getting to be a little bit scary living, doing business in Colorado with all the changes going on. So here's the other side of the building. There's a grocery store we rent to, a restaurant we rent to, and we also have a land lease for that coffee shop. That coffee shop is not impacted because of its square footage and its size. So it doesn't matter for it. It doesn't matter for that FedEx office down there, if you can see that building. It doesn't matter for that building. It doesn't matter for that building. It doesn't matter for that building. It might matter for that one behind the US Bank sign over there. And then there's a Safeway across the street that that would matter for too. And the grocery store situation is very interesting because of the energy, and we've actually had an assessment done and talked to our local electric company about that, and you won't believe what they said about helping out with their energy efficiency and how that's being handled compared to the restaurant, my office, and the dance studio over here. Okay, so here's what the new law is. The Building Performance Colorado um, Act or something or other. And I didn't even know about this until our electric company called us and said, hey, your building has to abide by these guidelines. We had no idea. Uh, there's a lot of different bills and different things that go through the Colorado um, government, and they don't always tell everybody what those are. And so because our building is more than 50,000 square feet in one building, we have to abide by these new rules and regulations. And basically, what they say is that, yes, the purpose is to reduce greenhouse gas. Um, go through all of this. The Colorado Climate Action Plan to Reduce Pollution established economy-wide targets for greenhouse gas emissions, reduction of 26% by 2025, 50% by 2030, and 90% by 2050 from a 2005 baseline. In 2021, the state of Colorado released its Greenhouse Gas Pollution Reduction Roadmap, and yada, yada, yada. I don't know why they used a 2005 baseline. That's kind of odd. But anyway, um, in response to this, yes, the Energy Performance for Building Statute, hereafter, hereafter referenced to as HB 21-1286, to help reduce emissions, lower energy costs, and foster job growth. It established building sector-wide emission reduction targets of 7% by 2026 and 20% by 2030 from a 2021 energy use baseline. To achieve these targets, the statute established statewide building benchmarking requirements for covered buildings and required that the emission reduction targets be met through building performance standards. So my building, because it's more than 50,000 square feet, has to reduce emissions by 7% by 2026 and 20% by 2030. Um, of course, we have to pay a fee for this program to exist, and we m so, sort of have to pay a fee to Excel to do the benchmarking. That's our electric company's Excel. And this will tell you which buildings must comply, uh, 50,000 square feet or larger by a single building, right? If you have groups of buildings in the same property, it doesn't matter, it just has to be a single building. So if my building was 40,000 square feet 
and 20,000 square feet, it wouldn't matter. If I had 10 40,000 square foot buildings, it wouldn't matter. It's just because it's 68,000 square feet, more than 50,000 square feet, that it has to comply with this. Now, this is, of, of course, of course, this is the interesting part. Public buildings. A public building is owned by the state, local government, a district or special district regulated under Title 32, a state or private institution of higher education, a school district or a charter school. Public building owners are required to comply with the annual benchmarking requirements. So every year we have to send them a report that says what our energy is. However, public building owners are only required to bring their building into compliance with the performance standards if the building undergoes a construction or renovation project where the estimated cost is at least $500,000, excluding finishes. So complete rebuild. <laughs> yeah. Um, at least 25% of the building square footage is impacted and excludes upgrades such as painting, flooring, or tenant finishes that do not impact energy use. So basically you've got to do $500,000 worth of modifications on the core, the structure of the building or the major systems, but that's not all. Public building owners are not required to pay the annual fee and are not subject to civil penalties under this program. So if they don't do it, they're just like, oh, that's fine, you can, it doesn't really matter. So basically public buildings are exempt from the rules that the state of Colorado put in place. Why, I don't know. You'd think the government would want to contribute to the reduction in greenhouse gases if they feel that's so important, but apparently they don't. It's up to the private citizens to do it and pay for it and reduce the state's emissions. Now, there are exemptions. Again, I don't know why. If it's less than 50,000 square feet, we get that. Um, the building is a storage facility, standalone parking garage, or airplane hangar that lacks heating and cooling. So if you're just doing storage, no heating or cooling, you don't need it. And if the building has more than half of the gross floor area dedicated to manuf manufacturing, industrial, or agricultural purposes, agricultural products and manufacturing purposes do not include marijuana cultivation facilities. So um, if you're manufacturing or doing industrial work or ag work, it doesn't you don't apply to this either. Unfortunately, we don't do any of that here. And then if the building is a single family home duplex or triplex, you're not bound to this. Multifamily is, if you've got more four units or more, you have to do it. But if you've got a 50,000 square foot house, you don't have to. Again, I don't know why they would exclude houses that are that large, because it seems like those would be the type of buildings you're targeting. And especially if you own a 50,000 square foot house, there's a good chance you've got the means to make those reductions and make those changes. Not that there are that many 50,000 square foot houses in Colorado, but I think there are a few. All right, um, now this does say that this does not supersede local um, building codes if those are stricter. So like Boulder, some areas have even stricter um, emissions on buildings. So if it's stricter, this doesn't supersede that. Uh, but if it's less strict, of course, you have to go by this. So we did our benchmarking, um, Excel did that for us, and we submitted that report even though I think we were supposed to do it before, but we literally had no idea this was hump coming or, or happening. Um, and then from this point on, every year we have to do one of those. If we ever sell the property, we have to supply those. If we ever list the property, we have to supply those, all of that. And then if you don't, um, there are some waivers. If the property is distressed, um, unoccupied for a certain period, a demolition um, permit was issued. If there's major financial distress, things like that, um, there can be some waivers issued but um, the annual fee is $100 per building. I mean, not exorbitant, but still. Seems odd they make these laws and rules and then we have to pay for them that they impose on us anyway. Um, so, the performance targets, like I said, 7% by 2026. And this is based on your 2021 benchmark. And the, the really crazy part about this, there were some positives, but I'm sure someone paid for it here. There's a lot of this that goes through here. Maybe I'll try and link to it in the comments below. 
But we had Excel, our energy company, come through and they say, hey, hey, we'll do a free assessment for you. We'll look at your building. We'll, we'll see where we can save you money. So they came through my office. They came through the dance studio. They came through the restaurant, El Cielo. And they did that for free. And they came back and said, hey, we will install LED lights and ballast for free in most of your area. Hopefully, that'll help you reduce the costs and help you get towards that benchmark. I'm like, that's awesome. Now, of course, nothing is ever free. You know, someone's paying for that, either the state of Colorado taxpayers or Excel, and which raises other people's energy costs, but it's free to us. Well, we have the grocery store, which occupies, oh, uh, 50,000, 52,000 square feet, I think. They occupy most of the building. Obviously, a grocery store uses copious amounts of energy because of all the coolers, um, warmers, the lights that are on all the time, uh, they use a ton of energy to keep food cool and, and from spoiling and to you know provide people with food, which makes sense. Well, we're like, okay, Excel, can you do the same thing for the grocery store? And their answer was, they use too much power, we won't do an assessment for free. So we had to pay $250, again, not a huge amount, but still seems odd that that was the reasoning for them to do an energy assessment. They went through the grocery store, did their energy assessment, came back and guess what they said this time? They said, yes, there's a lot of things that can be done to reduce energy, lights, different things, but we're not gonna do it for free like we did for you guys because they use too much energy. I'm still trying to wrap my head around why that makes it so they don't do it because it uses too much energy. <laughs> like, are you guys just happy to keep collecting that high energy bill and that's why you're not doing it? It made no sense to me, but that's what we're stuck with. That's what we're trying to figure out. And I guess we'll keep working with these benchmarks and Excel and trying to figure out how to reduce our carbon footprint and the energy efficiency of this building. Now, solar, you know, I thought about that option, putting solar on the roof. We have a massive roof up there, but that would be an incredibly expensive system to put a dent in the electric use in this building. And solar is very expensive to install. And um, per how much space it takes up, right, it's not terribly efficient. So I don't know if that would make much difference or not. Um, in this situation on houses where, that use much less electricity, maybe it makes more sense. So there's some different things we've been looking into, but um, it's a very weird situation. And this is not all that Colorado is doing as far as weird stuff for landlords, building owners, even businesses. Here are a few other things going on right now. Now, here are the two of the most restrictive laws that went into place last year. There were a lot of laws they tried to pass. Luckily, not all of them passed. They wanted to give first refusal to government entities to buy any property that had five units or more. That was a crazy law. There were some other ones that were pretty crazy that luckily did not get passed. Of course, they're trying to pass them again every single year. But here are some of the ones that did pass. Um, Limitations on income considering considerations for prospective tenants. SB 23184, and this is already law. This is passed. It's not something proposed. It's a law. Prohibits the landlord from considering certain information relating to prospective tenants' income. The change applies when a landlord relies on credit and rental history to make decisions regarding tenant applica applicants. The prospective tenant does not rely on a housing subsidy to assist with rent payments. The new law states... A landlord cannot mandate that a prospective tenant earn more than 200% of the yearly rent amount. So a lot of landlords will say they want three times income, have certain income uh, requirements for tenants. Now, we cannot have any of those restrictions if it's above 200% of the yearly rent amount. So if a property rents for $1,000 a month, that's $12,000 a year. If the tenant makes more than $24,000 a year, that's good enough. If it's lower than that, then the landlord can say no. If it's $24,000 or higher, we cannot say you're denied because of income. That's a law, we can't do it. The other thing that almost was even worse, but isn't quite, a landlord, let's see here, in the case of a prospective tenant relying on a housing subsidy for like, um, you know, HUD, Colorado State, you know, housing subsidies, Section 8, the landlord also may not consider the prospective tenant's creditor score unless required by federal law. So if Section 8 requires you consider the credit score, 
then that's the only way you can do it. If they are using any kind of housing subsidy, you can't consider their credit. If they've got a 400 credit score, it doesn't matter. We can't consider it. And in realistically, what this does, even though there's also a law that says um, landlords cannot discriminate based on income source. So like what that basically means is we can't say, no, we're not taking Section 8 or no, we're not taking a uh, tenant with housing subsidies. We have to you know, accept whatever source they're using. But if they do use one of those sources, we can't check their credit now. But in reality, what that will force some landlords to do, whether they should or not, is to not accept housing subsidies in any form because if they can't check credit that's a huge huge thing with rentals and credit is a major indication of if the tenants will pay which is very important to landlords now the first version of this law wanted to make it so landlords could not check credit on any tenants at all in any circumstance they later changed it and revised it to this but they wanted to make it so we can't check credit at all now there's some other interesting ones out there too um, for application fees you know an applicant if they've already got a credit check from somewhere they can keep using it over and over again not a big deal it actually makes sense to me security deposits can't be more than twice the rent so if the rent is a thousand dollars a month you can't have the security deposit more than two thousand a month which we've never done that either um, and then i believe oh, some of the ones that have been affecting us if you charge late fees and late fees are limited severely basically we can make the late fees fifty dollars a month on most properties that's it no more than that but if we go through an eviction if they're late on rent they don't have to pay the late fees right if we go through an eviction if, if a tenant's five thousand dollars behind on rent and they've got thousand dollars of late fees racked up all they have to pay is the rent to get caught up again legally they don't have to pay those late fees that's also a new law in colorado although i think that happened two years ago not this last legislative session or, or whatever they have of course like i said i'm sure we'll have more restrictions here soon and i believe um there's oh, what is it with pets um we can't charge extra for pet rent i believe again double check all these laws of course, if it's a ESA animal, you can't charge any extra deposit or rent for that. I've got another video on that. That's a very slippery, tricky slope to um, deal with. And that's actually more at the federal level than the state level. So it's not getting easy here, that's for sure. And then you have this trying to get passed, which is completely different, but business-wise. We are in Weld County in Colorado there's a massive oil field under us there's a huge oil industry here there's a huge natural gas industry here and in fact another thing i've been hearing is that some areas in denver are banning any new subdivisions from having natural gas even though it's one of the cleanest burning most um uh efficient and there's tons of natural gas they want to eliminate natural gas in homes just have them be electric I don't know what happens when everything's electric and our electric grid goes down. But anyway, that's another story. Colorado senators propose landmark ban on new oil and gas drilling. Now, this hasn't passed yet, but again, it's something they're trying to pass. And people tell me all the time, these are crazy bills. They're never going to pass. Well, some of those crazy bills are passing and becoming laws, as we just stated. Colorado senators, senators Sonia Jaquez and Lewis and Kevin Priola introduce a bill to ban new oil and gas drilling operations by 2030, prioritizing environmental protection and public health. The industry argues against the ban, um, yada, yada, yada. This is not limiting oil wells or fracking. They want to ban all new oil wells in the entire state permanently no more oil drilling for oil um here we go yeah this legislation aims to outlaw any new oil and gas drilling operations in the state by 2030. the pr proposal which is expected to be presented to the legislature in the coming weeks seeks to prioritize the protection of the minority and lower income communities these communities often disproportionately affected by the environmental impacts of oil and gas production would be among the first to benefit from this ban um, our area has quite a few, I would say, lower income communities, minority income areas, and I don't have stats to back this up. Oil and gas jobs are some of the best, highest paying jobs out there that do not require education, schooling, 
they are some of the best jobs for low income communities. This would take those away and just destroy a massive part of the economy for those communities. Um, again, I don't have any stats to back that up, but just from personal experience, from knowing so many people, from having businesses and properties and stores in small towns throughout northern Colorado, I can tell you for sure this would massively hurt many people in the economy here, and I don't exactly know how it would help them in any way. I don't know. Like, I wonder if it actually tells us. So I've looked at a few articles, read through them. I can't find any information on how it's going to improve the lives. I guess maybe because there'll be less pollution is the only thing I can think of. But again, no data has been provided on that pollution or where it comes from or if it's oil and gas drilling or other issues. Who knows? But we can be sure that restricting oil and gas drilling will make it more expensive. So if you're hoping for lower price of the gas pumps, um, if more and more bills like this get passed, that definitely will not happen. Probably the opposite will happen. And then we'll have people getting mad. The gas is too expensive, but then the oil companies are not able to drill. And then there's reasons for all these things to happen. And there is no perfect world where everybody is happy. That's for sure. Um, Colorado has been leaning very left for a while. Is no secret that they're following California in many different ways of legislation and unfortunately Colorado leads the nation in car thefts, has massive amounts of crime now, has been one of the states increasing significantly in crime where most states are decreasing across the country and I believe a lot of that is due to some of these policies and different things being implemented. I try not to get political too much on YouTube with different things but um, this has been something that's been pretty clear at least with the crime policies and then completely banning oil and gas drilling which would be the first state in the country to do that. Not even California has done that or come close to it. Uh, um, is just pushing it over the edge along with the tenant landlord lord laws and for people who say those are needed and for tenants need protection that's why rents go up right every time you make it harder on landlords and more expensive on landlords rents go up to compensate for those extra costs they have and it chases landlords away who say i don't want to do business in colorado i'm going to go somewhere else i'm not going to build new apartment buildings or new housing in colorado i'm going to go somewhere else and now there's fewer housing options fewer rental properties and that just makes prices go up higher and higher and higher and then it's like oh we've got to do something about these landlords who keep raising prices we're going to make it tougher and stricter on them well more landlords leave prices get even higher that's that's just how it works that's the simple economics of it and if you look at the stats for all those people saying landlords are buying all the houses and ruining the housing market 1.2 million fewer rental properties now that are houses than 2016. the amount of houses that are rentals are decreasing significantly in that same time period there are 10 million more owner occupants of single family houses so Landlords are not buying all the houses. They're not forcing all the rents up because they're greedy. Um, what really forces rents up is a lack of housing, the selling of rental properties because of things like this happening and the rising costs of landlords as well. You will notice the absolute highest rents in the country are in the areas with the strictest laws the most tenant friendly laws and the most landlord restrictive laws are where rents are the highest and they also tend to have the strictest building development codes and try to stop building which also increases prices as well all right there we go um this new rule on the building that i'm in right now it's not the end of the world it's just an example of what's happening it's be interesting to see how it plays out the fines i didn't mention that i think it's two thousand dollars a year if we don't hit that the first offense and then five thousand um if we don't get it and that's cumulative that keeps going and then they're very clear to say you can't just not do this and pay the fines you have to do it and pay the fines or i don't know what exactly the punishment will be then i don't feel like reading through those 80 page bills that are very hard to understand i'm not sure if the people who write them understand them but um they're definitely not making it easy on us private owners but again the public doesn't have to abide by those rules. Okay, love to hear what you think. We'll be back soon with more other videos on laundromats, businesses, rental property slips, more fun stuff like that. Thanks for watching, be back soon.